Okay, good afternoon and welcome to this AC webinar. I'm Hannah Vickers, I'm the Chief Executive of the Association for Consultancy and Engineering. And this is an AC Insights webinar looking specifically at Brexit. Um, so what we are focusing on today is what this actually means for your business and what you need to be doing now in order to prepare. So this is all about giving you a final checklist, if you like, uh, to understand some of the practical things you will need to put in place to be ready for Brexit. Now, we recognise that there's still quite a lot of uncertainty and there's even this morning been, um, you know, debates in the press about where we will ultimately end up. What we're trying to do here is kind of cut through all of that. So this isn't a political webinar. This is very much around some of the practical changes and some of the practical implications uh, and some of the guidance that is available through both the Construction Leadership Council and our work at ACE to help you get ready. So this meeting today is going to be recorded. So if you miss anything, you will be able to watch it back. It will all be available on our website, but obviously do, uh, do keep along with us for the next hour or so while we work through this. We're also going to be having the opportunity for Q&A, which I will come on to in a second. So I just wanted to do some housekeeping before I introduce our guest speakers. So if you haven't been on one of these before, um, there are a few things that we would like to do just to make this a bit more enjoyable. So you will have a much clearer sound if you use headphones. Um, you have got the opportunity to ask questions, ideally through the Q&A panel, but you can also put them in the chat and we will have some time at the end to pick those up. Um, anything that we can't answer today, we will come back to you on, but we will endeavour to get through as many as we can uh, this morning while we've got this hour together. And then finally, we'll get sent the recording as well as it being on our website. And you can share it with your colleagues and anyone you think it may be of use to. So we don't lock this. This is an open recording uh, for anybody that, that would benefit from, from hearing the guidance that we're going to talk through today. OK, so I'm going to introduce our guests this morning. So we have two guests. Um, firstly, we have James Butcher, who is the head of policy at the National Federation of Builder, for Builders. And for his sins, James is the Brexit lead for the Construction Leadership Council and has had the unenviable job of drawing together some of the really detailed technical guidance that we need to understand as part of the construction sector in order to be ready. So he's doing a sterling job um, on that. And then secondly, we've got uh, ACE's Claire Clifford, who is our Head of HR and Business Support at ACE, and she will be just walking you through a bit more detail about what it means for consultants and obviously um, helping you going forward if you have any sort of follow up queries, Claire will be your lady. So I'm going to introduce James now to kick us off with his guidance he's been working through. He is a, an expert, shall we say, a newly formed expert on Brexit. So James, delighted to have you with us uh, this afternoon. Now you've produced quite a number of Brexit briefings that you're going to talk through, but perhaps before we start, if I could just ask you, and this is a really unfair question to kick off with, you know, where do you think we are? Could you just sort of give us a very brief download on, um, on where we are in terms of, uh, you know, the likely path to Brexit over the next few weeks and the sort of political situation? And then we will move into the, the brilliant guidance that you've been developing over the last few weeks with the Construction Leadership Council. James. Well, Hannah, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, personally, I think, and I, I'm going to talk through this a little bit more in my presentation, I think that we are heading for a uh, no-deal Brexit. And I actually think that people um, who are hoping for a, uh, a deal Brexit should be very, very aware that whatever happens, change is coming. And the difference between the deal Brexit and no deal Brexit, actually in the grand scheme of things, is perhaps smaller than we've been led to believe. Uh, and, and in light of that, um, the CLC uh, Working Group has produced a number of uh, guidance documents, which is really about readying the entire industry, not just uh, members on this call, uh, but the whole supply chain. So, um, yeah, I'll touch on that in a minute. Okay, really interesting. And as you say, I think it is quite um, timely to be looking at this because we may ultimately end up in this uh, space of having to implement a number of these changes anyway, whether we have a deal or not. It's more a case of timing and the level of urgency and maybe the level of sort of impact on the 1st of January, shall we say. OK, James, if you'd just like to take us through your, your guidance and then we will come back to you with the opportunity for questions. So please keep your questions coming in whilst James is speaking and we will get a chance to pick his brains further uh, a little later on the webinar. James, thank you. Great, thank you. If I could have my uh, the next slide, please. So, and uh, that's it. Perfect. Thank you, Chetna. So, 
the, the first key message for everybody is that the end of the transition period really is here and it really is the end this time after all these years. We have 24 days uh, from today and counting and there will be changes as I already just mentioned. Freedom of movement is going to end so employment is going to be very different and we have the new points-based immigration system. Our customs arrangements are changed, changing. There's gonna be a new customs regime, deal or no deal. Now a deal might make things a little bit smoother, but generally speaking, there are gonna be significant changes at the border. And we know there's a lot of nervousness uh, around that. We are leaving the single market. So standards and alignment is gonna change. Uh, and of course, at the moment, we do not have a deal. Now, if we get a deal, we're going to be uh, benefiting from the uh, from from the low tariffs or no tariffs rather, because hopefully it'll be a free trade agreement. And indeed, there's some important pieces of European uh, regulation which relate to things like um, a mutual recognition of professional standards, which we would hope would be included in the deal. But my key and first message to you is that change is coming, and so being aware of that and helping your supply chains, and indeed your customers to be aware of that is absolutely critical. Uh, and indeed, I hope that you'll get some reassurance from us that what we're trying to do here is to ensure as much continuity as possible. So moving on. Firstly, who are we? So Hannah has given a really good, I think, um, overview of, of, of who the CLC Brexit Working Group is. Um, we started in August and indeed you will be no doubt well aware of the work of the CLC uh, as Hannah is a very senior member and has led a lot of the initiatives over the COVID crisis. Um, now, we realised as a group that we needed to keep our eyes on the horizon and that business readiness, looking at continuity, uh, needed to be enacted and we reflected on some of the government guidance and some of the key issues that we thought the industry was facing and decided that actually we needed this Brexit working group. We needed to start doing our bit as a CLC, cascading information down uh, as much as possible so that we could ensure that while we dealt with COVID, we didn't take our eye off the horizon and then compound the issues that I think probably a lot of you are facing and indeed, certainly from my point of view, our members are facing already. So there's a broad group of people and I chair the overarching working group, but under, underneath us, we have a number of work streams. So we've got movement of goods and materials, movement of people, standards and alignment, contracts and procurement, data adequacy, and then exports. And uh, you'll be pleased to know that Hannah is, Hannah is involved in the exports group. And indeed, there's a subgroup of the exports group that's looking at those opportunities going forward with other nations and other uh, our trading relations uh, as we go on. And that piece of work is under, being undertaken now, but of course, will continue into the future. So making sure that we take good advantage of those opportunities in the future is a key part of what we're trying to do. If I could have the next slide. And there are three main overarching aims of what we're trying to achieve. The first is to signpost that guidance and make sure that as much as possible, businesses know what they need to do before the end of this year. And indeed know the changes that are likely to come and indeed make sure that they can then pass that on to the people who they work with, be that colleagues, be that people they employ, uh, be that partners, be that um, uh, further up the supply chain or indeed further down the supply chain too. And through this process, and it's been going on since August, and each of those groups has had around 60 different organisations interacting with them. And many of those organisations have been representing uh, membership bodies as well. We have we have identified a number of issues that we have needed to have solved by the government. And you'll have probably noticed over the last month or so that the government has really upped its game in terms of communicating with construction. And a lot of that, I, um, I think, has come from the pressure from the CLC, from the information and issues that we've identified and the reassurance that we've said that industry needs. And so government has worked to rectify those things. There are some specific issues that we're still working on around immigration and uh, notified bodies, for example, and we continually uh, making sure that those critical issues that we face are being addressed by government. And today I would be interested to hear on anything that you think needs to be solved by the end of the year. And then touching on that work that I said Hannah's involved in, maximising the opportunities, be that through the uh, negotiations with the EU or indeed future trade deals with the rest of the world. So if I have the next slide. What I really want to cover is what we have been doing, that guidance, that piece of work, and indeed, therefore, what you need to know and what you need to do about it. So the first piece of uh, guidance that we've produced 
is on the movement of people. And this is a big one. And we have a, a second piece of um, guidance coming out on the movement of people, which clarifies some of these issues. And I've seen, I've been fortunate enough to see uh, Claire's slides, and I know that she's going to touch on some, uh, some of the issues. And then at the end, if there are any questions on this, I'd be happy to try and clarify them. But first and foremost, there's a new points based immigration system uh, that actually opened in December a few days ago now um, and is open for applications and it comes in uh, on in force on the 1st of January. The common travel area with Ireland still exists um, and we have, of course, the skilled worker route, which is the main work uh, route in, as well as, of course, the occupation list, which means that you can use points to earn your entry. But this is obviously a fundamental change from the freedom of movement that we have seen. Um, and it will require businesses to become licensed sponsors. And that's not a quick or easy process. It takes it, it requires people in your organization to take a lead on it. Indeed, you might want to get um, external uh, consultancy in order to become one. Uh, it's, it takes about eight weeks or so, or so to apply and it has a cost with it. It has a cost with it both to become a licensed sponsor and then in to, indeed to get people uh, in under that sponsorship. And there will be, of course, therefore changes to um, EU citizens and we include within that EEA and Swiss, uh, Swiss uh, migrants as well. And of course, uh, Conversely, there will be changes for those EU workers uh, in the EU. And this document here, um, which is available on the CLC's website, but actually for you guys, has been adapted uh, and made more relevant for you uh, by ACE, and you can get it on, on their website, uh, addresses these, these topics and these issues so that you can see what you need to do in order to be ready. And we, of course, we touch on that, as I mentioned earlier, the mutual recognition of prof professional qualifications currently governed by an EU directive not yet set to be replaced and so in that regard we're really hoping for a deal that secures that but there will be um, a grace period so although we've left the transition period there's a grace period for EU citizens and it's worth being aware of that because between the 1st of January and the 30th of June next year EU citizens will still be able to come into the country and the right to work checks that you make on them will not change from this year. It will be illegal to discriminate to do a different right of work check by uh, against an EU citizen than anybody else in the UK. So you just need to be aware of those things. Uh, and we can explore some of that in the question uh, session later. If I could have the next slide. Of course, another big thing is goods and materials, and this really reflects the changes at the cust um, at border and, and, and our new customs regime, which will come in. And if you've been paying attention, and I'm absolutely positive that you have, it will mean differences between trade in Great Britain and Northern Ireland, between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland. So there are going to be differences between trade within the UK, as well as with Great Britain and the European Union, Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and Northern Ireland and the European Union. Uh, in this document, we touch on things like the new tariffs, which is called the uh, UK Global Tariff, which actually takes quite a sensible and pragmatic approach and rounds down a lot of tariffs to make them a bit easier. And indeed, as much as possible, removes them too. There will also be tariff rate quotas. And this document will help you to see those, uh, to access that information on the government's website and indeed find the right product codes, et cetera, to work out those cost differences. We touch a bit on standards and alignment and indeed pro try to provide some reassurances in terms of the preparedness of the border. Now, generally speaking, we are expecting the delays to be going into the European Union, not coming out of the European Union. The UK has taken quite a liberalised approach to the declaration of goods. Indeed, you can declare goods up to six months after uh, to start with when the new regime comes in, coming into the UK. But the EU wants to protect and, and uh, rightly so, it's customs territory and so the changes actually going into the European Union are where the difficulties are going to lie uh, and in and whether uh, UK businesses have prepared for that properly. And we touch in this document as well on some of the anticipated shortage materials and stockpiling issues that we face and colleagues from the BMF, the CPA and the TTF have provided some links and some surveys of their members of where they expect those shortages shortages and issues to be to try and give people a bit of a chance to mitigate some of those issues. So moving on. Probably the most technical document that we've produced um, and really I think from um, from from this uh, perspective is probably 
the most complex complicated to, to kind of understand and this is largely because some of the um, infrastructure behind these changes hasn't actually uh, been introduced yet so we know how the regulations are going to work but we don't necessarily know the bodies behind them that are going to um, you know, are going to make sure that they work properly uh, come the end of the year it currently works under an organization called EOTA there is no UK version of EOTA and the products databases etc that exist in the sorry not the products databases the databases that allow those um, procedures uh, in order to ensure that uh, things are technically approved don't exist in the UK at the moment and, and need to be by the end of the year but this document touches on what marking you might expect to see and it is again a very complicated environment there are two types of market marking there's the marking that's going to happen between the beginning of next year and the end of next year and then the marking that's likely to occur uh, in 2022 afterwards and there are three marks and any number of combinations of them there's the uk cea mark uh, there is the ce mark and then there is the ce plus uk ni mark uh, they can be used in different region in different parts of the uk uh, in different ways and depending on the manufacturer and this document tries to address that and it's worth spending a little bit of time to try and familiarize yourself with this because it is slightly complex uh, and you will see, you will always see CE marked goods in the UK because, for example, even after 2022, a manufacturer in Northern Ireland can um, put a CE marking on so long as they get it approved by an EU uh, approved body. And under the unfettered uh, access arrangement, they can then place that on the GB market. But GB manufacturers. Can. So, as you can see, it's complicated. And the next uh, slide, please. This is a fairly easy one, and I would anticipate that probably quite a few of you have already done this. Um, when we, you will remember the GDPR and the impl uh, implementation of that last year, and of course the important protection, protections that this provides um, for data transfers between UK businesses and EU businesses in respect of personal data. This will change. The, the EU has not declared us a data safe country, even though the UK has said that the EU is data safe. So what it means is that data transfers across the uh, channel will be slightly affected. But there are some easy ways that we can get around this. And most of the time it's a mitigating um, clause put into a into a contract. So it's worth having a, look, a quick look at this document just to make sure that there won't be any disruption. Um, it's, it's a fairly easy and straightforward thing to do. If you do have uh, businesses or, or partner businesses or uh, offices in, in different parts of the um, EU, you will need to appoint an EU representative and indeed make sure that you are both looking at the UK's uh, data protection uh, laws as well as the EU ones. And of course, because we are now leaving, they will diverge. So if I could have the next slide, please. And this, I think, I really point out that there are other documents in the industry that exist. Now, one of ours is from the NFB is a document that we produced with the law firm Erwin Mitchell and Build UK. Our colleagues at Build UK have also uh, uh, provided a document called Are Your Contracts Brexit Ready, which is relied like bell. And I just wanted to put these here just to make sure that you are familiar with them, because you may well see them. Um, and so you can see where some of the, the standard contractual clauses or the, the what the so-called Brexit clauses are and just be aware of them in your um, in your ongoing work and why you might see contract differences in contractual clauses caused by Brexit. And so I think that probably brings me quite nicely on to the um, on to where we go from here. I've talked a lot about the guidance and some of the changes that you might need to anticipate, but of course there's a much uh, larger piece of work going and all of those issues have encountered through the, through the working groups, we are now liaising with the departments on and continue to do that. We have high level communications with government where it's a critical issue and then much more uh, intricate working with the departments. The IPA is looking at government reform and I think Hannah's been involved in that as well. There is obviously the exports and trade work stream looking at those opportunities in other markets. Uh, and indeed, we would really encourage you to provide as much information in terms of feedback. And I think from, from your guys' perspective, that you're probably going to be um, more happy with the uh, immigration rules as they are than, than some of the much lower skilled 
uh, trades in our industry. But making sure that you continue to feed back information, blips, issues uh, to ACE so that they can feed those back to government and problem solve, because we anticipate that there will be several months of severe problem solving at the beginning of next year. And if I can just leave you with a, a key message, it's make sure you use ACE. They've got some excellent experts. They sit at the top of the CLC, have those, uh, they're really dialed into government. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a reason that you're a member of this association and it, and it is so that you can get these things done. We are all here ready and working to try and make the construction industry work as best as we possible possibly can um, despite Brexit <laughs> uh, and the changes that are coming and the uncertainty that we're currently facing and indeed try and make sure that we take advantage of the opportunities that lay in the months and years ahead and I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much James. No that's brilliant, um, very comprehensive and I think you know sort of shows fantastically how the collaboration across the CLC has been working to be able to get that quantity and that you know quality of guidance out in the last few weeks has been nothing short of uh, astonishing so well done um, I think you're right in that you've got a few months of um, how did you say it? like strategic problem solving or fast track problem solving ahead um, as we get into the new year but as you said I think we're all there um, trying to work collectively on this so appreciate all that you've done and sharing your your guidance with us so I'm going to just um, hand to Claire now who is going to focus a little bit more on the people uh, implications of Brexit um, and then we have got quite a few questions as well so um, James get your you know self psyched up to answer those because I've got a few here to to go through with you shortly but Claire did you want to just sort of take us through the people elements of of Brexit and what it, what it means and what our members can be doing to prepare? Yeah absolutely and uh, yeah thank you James there's a, a few links to your presentation uh, which is great I think some people are going to be sat there thinking, oh, gosh, I've not really done much yet. Am I too late? Um, it's not ideal. It would have been great for us to have started work on this a bit before. But even if you haven't started, there are some simple things that you can kickstart right now to try and put yourself in the best possible position when it comes to your people and the changes that Brexit brings. The major one is this knowing your workforce. And as James said, you know, we still do have um, the discrimination law in place. So we do make, need to make sure that we're not discriminate, discriminating against any particular um, employee. So the best thing to do, and it's a great time of year to do this anyway, to set you up for next year, is to start taking a look at your HR records. If you're in a large organization, no doubt you have a um, HR team and database and things like that already in place. If you're a small, medium organization, maybe you, this is something you don't always think about. It's not in the forefront of your mind, but now is a great time to do a bit of housekeeping and bring your HR records up to date. So when people are joining your organization, you would most likely have checked their passport for their right to work. Um, it's great to do that again now to make sure that you haven't got any gaps, there isn't anybody that's missing. You're also able to talk to them about have they got their settled status? Do they need any support to try and ensure they have their settled status if they wish to remain in the UK? Uh, the deadline for that is fast approaching for January. So if people haven't gone through settled status um, and they would like to, then there's lots of information out there to help you download the app, do it through mobile device or, or, or online. But um, if you do need some help with people with settled status, then by all means, you can contact us and we can give you some further support. It's also worth doing that maybe through um, some voluntary and mandatory surveys online. You could run a survey monkey, Google Forms to collect this data. So it doesn't have to cost you a lot or, or take a lot of time, but it's good to really understand your workforce whether or not they will have the right to remain here make sure you've got like i say the passport to check right to work obviously currently i think it's ten thousand pound fine if we haven't got that correct so it's worth doing anyway you could run some days post pandemic to bring your passport to work to make sure managers check it's right so there's a lot of things you could do to get to understand your employee base and one key reason for doing this is not only do you know who you have in your organization that, that they have a right to work there for you, but going forward, if there are limits to what countries people can travel to for you, represent you, if there's meetings that are happening across Europe and beyond, you'll be able to schedule those and make sure you have the right, any entry permits or work permits you may need for people coming into and out of the UK. If we can move on to the next slide, that would be great. 
One of the biggest things I hear in terms of people being concerned is around um, the skills piece. Um, and James mentioned that as well about recognizing the qualifications. There's a good website that you can log on and check where um, qualifications across the, the world basically, but hopefully we'll be in a place where qualifications are recognized. But one of the biggest things to do is to have a look at conti continuing to, 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 to train your own people. Um, and I know there's a lot of work happening in AC partnering with other organizations as well to look at the training. And it's something that, yes, we, we know can be a huge investment in some areas, but the longer term um, rewards are, are great. You'll, you'll help to protect the people that are there with you and you will be able to obviously then also create and build your own workforce and, and skills. This links onto the next slide really, which is talking about attraction and retention. This is another area where people are worried around retaining their, their top talent, um, whether or not they're going to be able to fill open positions, and I think what we can do is very early in the new year, start to put together some plans that allow us to have a look inwardly at our organizations and ensure that we are in the best possible place to, to attract top talent and to also prevent the people moving on. So um, one of the big things that we could look at is, is, is the employee proposition. So the value, what we give to our employees, what our brand image and our identity is for our employees. Um, if we do that, we're gonna then be able to really demonstrate and show that we're a great place to come and work. What's the difference? What's the point of difference? And by investing in this area, we will be able to ensure that we do our utmost to retain that talent. Working with a number of SMEs, one of the areas that we don't always look at in great detail is things like social media. So right now, if you were to be able to share on social media, the fact that you are ready for Brexit, that we are enhancing the employee brand, that we are looking to maybe sponsor, if that's one avenue you want to go to in terms of visas, or potentially you want to sponsor some qualifications so that they are recognized in the UK. A number of these avenues will really help you to attract their talent but more importantly as well, to, to retain that talent. We could go on, on to the next slides where we look a bit more around the recruitment side. So now that there could be restrictions um, from recruiting from the EU, could this now be an opportunity for you to look wider before potentially we may have limited ourselves to the EU because it was very easy and simple to uh, attract talent. But now maybe if you do need to become a sponsor because the skill set is different, you might want to have a look wider to, to, to cast that net a bit further and experience what else and who else you could find out there. The other piece is, like I say, making a business attractive. Have a look at your internal processes and policies. Sometimes they are like the hidden annoyance within an organization. How is that stopping retention um, from, from keeping your people to doing surveys, to embedding them in the organization? So some of these things might not seem that they're directly linked to Brexit, but when we're facing a time of change and a time of challenge, it's really good to make sure that we've got that people engagement piece really locked down. So I think the, the thing that I would say is to make sure that your people know that you understand that you know they know that you're there to help them that also as a business you're on that one step forward you're looking further down the line so rather than just being reactive doing the things about knowing your workforce gathering all the data that you need also demonstrate the proactive side of yourself and, and your HR teams and the people responsible in your organization and that's like I say looking at creating training programs to upskill and retain your talent and also looking at your your impact out there in the marketplace from your employee brand make sure you're a great place to come and work and that they can see that you understand that Brexit may well bring some concerns and some issues but as an employer you're there to help support them through that. I think for me, there's still some uncertainty in the HR space, and it's definitely something that we keep an eye on and, and can come back to you with as we go on. Um, there's a, a few areas around, um, like I touched on before, around meetings. Can you travel anywhere in the EU for a meeting? The likelihood is yes. Most likely you can come in and out for meetings. There will be, you won't need necessarily visas. 
one of the other questions that um, I've been asked as well is around people who don't have settled status, what happens to those people? And of course, there's a lot of personal emotions involved in people still in the UK that may not yet or do not want to have settled status. They're the people that when you do knowing your workforce, you'll be able to have a look at how you help them. And is it that you will need to sponsor them a visa or have a challenging conversation with them? So I urge you to do that. A little bit of housekeeping at the beginning, great time of year, as I said, to do that, and then work on your strategy for retention and recruitment going forward. There's a number of helplines and, and uh, websites that you can go on to seek out more information. And I think most things are covered in these websites, but again, you can always drop hat on myself or the team, um, any questions that we'll be able to help you going forward. Okay, thank you, Claire. No, that's really nice. And it, it sort of makes it all a bit more real, doesn't it, when you start to talk about people and individuals and what it what it means for them. So no, that's brilliant. Okay, so I'm going to kick off. We've got a few questions. I'm going to try and share the love and I'll bounce around a bit just so that we can get to, to both of you. So James, the first one's for yourself and it sort of touches a bit on the kind of product coding. Um, so obviously our members work a lot in terms of designs and specifications. And we've got a question about... Um, is this going to impact on historic designs and specs? So if you have previously done a design and you've given a specification for something which would be EU coded, uh, what should you be doing about that? Should you be warning the client? Should you be sort of proactively doing something? Or is it, you know, are we likely to have a, is there a kind of grace period where we can sort of use both and it, it won't, be, won't be a problem? That is a really good question and one of the questions that we put to government. Now, we understand that if it was historically specified, then you're OK. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there will be a grace period. But of course, the availability of those materials will, of course, change. And that is it, that is a key thing. So being aware of that and having the having the conversation with the client will not hurt at all, uh, because once it's obviously placed on the market, then that's OK for a period of time. Uh, but once our, so say we're now into um, 2020, for example, 2022, for example, uh, and the UK no longer recognises CE marking unless it's come via the NI market, um, then you just simply won't be able to get that product. So even though it was historically specified, it won't be available. And I think that's where the key is and that's where the conversation uh, needs to be had. So, yeah, a bit of flexibility here, but it's something that we are pushing government on. Okay. Brilliant. No, and as you say, that's the sort of thing that you know that you don't get from uh, from guidance or um, political statements. So really good insight. Thank you very much to that, James. Um, Claire, so I've got a question um, for you around the sort of sponsoring um, people to come in. So if you're an SME, um, the question is how easy is it uh, to you know to sponsor somebody, and then what sort of help does ACE give? For, for people or can offer or advice, I suppose they're, they're looking for uh -huh. around an SME, maybe wanting to do that, but a little bit unsure by the signs of things. Yeah, I'm sure James will be able to chip in as well. But is it easy? I think it's easy once you're set up and you're running, you've done a few. Um, it used to be quite easy to get a, a license. Um, you normally sort of need a named person and it's sort of, you know, regimented, fill in a few forms, become approved. One of the things you need to do is make sure you're really good at housekeeping, make sure that you are following all of the processes that you need to. Um, that's the biggest thing because you could get audited at some points. You do need to have to prove how you've gone about searching for those partic that particular talent. Um, so you have to have a bit of a paper trail. So um you can outsource that as well yeah you can ask a third party to do that for you um james i don't know if you have any more details on on that side of things but um it is easy uh you just need to have a bit of focus dedication to get it set up and of course the budget to do so because as james mentioned you have to pay to become uh, a sponsor and then each visa you need you know you'll be given an allocation basically of the volume of visas you're allowed but then each visa you then have to pay for too yeah claire's absolutely right um and also i think what claire was saying in her presentation is key it is going to be cheaper for members to keep the talent they've already got 
than to now go back and to, to let them go now and try and recruit them again in a few months time. So I think that's a, a really key message. The other thing, of course, and I want to reiterate is the time delay. If you're thinking about this, you need to start acting on it now, because if you come to try and want to recruit somebody from a foreign market, uh, you will you will have to apply to be a licensed sponsor that's not quick it's not uh, there is a there is an administrative burden for it and there is a cost so you want to think about that in advance rather than doing it um rather than doing it at the time you need it okay great as you say yeah there's a time and a cost but it's whether it's worth it okay brilliant thank you so james back to yourself for this one um this is probably sounds like the same person um they're interested in the material shortages back to kind of design specifications so where are we anticipating material shortages that we may need to be aware of as designers good good question so um actually the uh the biggest material shortage that we are looking at facing is in timber and that's not associated to brexit there are actually very few uh materials that will be um that will be there'll be a shortage of because of brexit the difference will be the cost inflation so for example most of most bricks um most bricks. This is just a. This is just a one that's come to my mind because I was I was dealing with it the other day. Most bricks are produced in the UK, but in times of high demand, we source them from the Netherlands or Belgium, for example. Now, in in that instance, there will be a tariff applied if we don't have a deal, and so there will be an inflationary effect to that. In terms of the actual availability, I would encourage you to have a good look at the um, at the document that's on uh, the link that um, James has has provided. On the materials and shortages because it has those surveys from the construction products association from the uh, builders merchants federation and the trade timber federation that gives you an idea uh, and also i know that build uk are doing some market surveillance and the bmf do a big widespread market surveillance under their product availability group which sits under the clc uh, and i'm sure hannah or, or one of the team will be able to help you in that regard um, but hopefully that's that's useful. Yeah, no, no, really helpful. And as you say, it's worth just being aware of the potential problem areas because it isn't, yeah, it's availability, but it's also a cost implication as well. So obviously we want to be aware of that for clients. Um, might start to influence designs, who, who knows, uh, in terms of some of the things that we will be looking to scope and design for next year. Might be something that's worth considering, particularly with cost implications if you've got a marginal scheme. Okay, great. Um, Claire, back to yourself. This is, I think this is a sneaky question. So somebody's asking about um, having staff moving between businesses. So if a business has uh, got somebody, sponsored somebody from Europe, can they then move to another business within the UK? Or how does that work um, if you've got that sort of sponsor organisation, but then they decide to leave them? Can you can you nick them, I think is the <laughs> polite way uh from memory and i need to just clarify this but each sponsor each organization has to be a sponsor so you are a named sponsor um so you couldn't just borrow them or um nick them and take them on that sponsor license across now that could have changed slightly but the you know a few months ago you, there wasn't the opportunity to nick them um, if it's within the house and you've got the top organization as the sponsor and then the other locations underneath, so you're under one umbrella, I would think there is something there which is intercompany transfer. There will be something around that. But yeah, if you've seen someone in another competitor and you want to borrow them, no, unfortunately, I don't think that's true. But we'll double check. Okay, thank you. No, no, that's a good one. So this is all the stuff that you, it never appears on the minister's uh, Q&A, does it? These sorts of questions. <laughs> Next stuff from my competitor. Okay, brilliant. Um, James, a bit of a technical one for yourself around data protection. So somebody asking around if they're in a JV with a European company, does the data protection GDPR um, rules and changes that you've, you've indicated, do those apply if you're in a JV um, working between two organisations or not? So the, the, the boundary is the, believe it or not, is the geographical boundary, not the fact that uh, your two companies working together, you will need an agreement of how you will share data across that geographical boundary. That's the key message. So you'll need an internal uh, agreement of how you will protect that data is the is the short uh, answer to that but if you are doing that it solves all your problems in terms of a designated person and indeed of that organization making sure that they are 
uh, aware of the regulatory changes and vice versa. So the key thing is making sure you've got an, an agreement between your uh, two organisations. And remember, it's only personal data, uh, personal um, data flows, making sure that those that you agree to abide by the relevant legislation of each one. So it's the geographical boundary that is the important thing there. Okay, so just to clarify that, so then if you say perhaps your JV partner is based in the, or has a base in the UK and you're sharing an office or something, then, you know, that, that is not crossing a geographical boundary, so to speak. Is that right? No, in that case, that should be fine. It just depends. Um, and then the whoever the partner is, uh, if they're doing, um, if they're passing personal flows of data across the, uh, across the border into the EU, then they will obviously need the agreement. If that personal flow comes from the EU into your partner and then on to you, then you'll need one. Okay. <laughs> oh, this is going to be complicated. Okay, no, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, right, a final question for yourself, Claire. Um, just around, this is, for, this is obviously an individual asking, they want to know how easy it is for them to move and find work in Europe as an engineer um, going forward. Do you, you know, is there, I just, I guess it's the other side of it is actually are we, you know, are, are all the things that you've talked about for us working here, are they yeah. the same in terms of professional qualifications and sponsoring? Does that all, you know, will companies recruiting from Europe for UK talent have the same sort of rules? Yeah, so um, each country will have their own. Um, so, yeah, you can't bank on, right, I'm going from the UK to Spain and from Spain across to Germany and then, I don't know, Germany across to somewhere else each country you will need to have a look at their requirements um obviously there is still some free flow across mainland europe but in terms of visas working rights qualifications you would still need to double check that each, you're meeting each country's requirements okay brilliant thank you no that's really clear um final one for yourself james i'm sure you've been asked this one before um and this is somebody asking about whether the uh, whether brexit is going to make it easier or harder for european firms to bid for contracts in the uk do you have a feel for that yet or is that still to be determined so at the moment it should be the same because um it's called the the, it's the World Trade Organization GPA, which is Government Agreement on Procurement. We are already part of that by virtue, or have been part of that by virtue of being a member of the EU. We have applied to the uh, WTO to join that again on leaving, and they have already authorized that. So on exit day, or sorry, the day after exit day, things will be the same. The, the difference will be, of course, when um, UK procurement rules change and we expect them to diverge from the, um, from the OGU, OGU rules. And therefore it may become easier because procurement is easier in the UK because the UK decides to diverge. Uh, if that happens, then the answer is yes. If not, then it will be the same. Um, there, are, there are two other points that are unrelated that I just wanted to, um, that I just wanted to touch on if, if you'll uh, allow me, which is I just wanted to give a reassurance that as long as you've given a, um, as long as you've undertaken a right to work check properly um, when you're employing somebody up until the 30th of June. And remember, as, as Claire said, and I think I mentioned as well, that right to work check for EU citizens next year is the same if you're employing them dom domestically. If you're reaching across and trying to grab them and then you only do a UK based right to work check, it's not the same. You'll need to use the points based immigration system. But if in February you employ an EU citizen in the UK where you've advertised a job in the UK, then you receive a statutory exemption from any prosecution if that person doesn't have a right to remain in the UK after the 30th of June. And that's really important because the government is saying you can't discriminate against an EU citizen in the UK next year until the 30th of June. So you can't ask them when they arrived in the UK and you can't ask them if they've got pre uh, or settled status, as in you can't discriminate against them on that basis. And so businesses will be very nervous that they'll therefore be prosecuted if in July that person no longer has a right to remain. That's not the case. As long as you've undertaken the right to work check at that point in time, you will be exempt from prosecution. So, you know, please uh, be, be assured of that. And I just think that was an important thing I had a discussion with the Home Office on and, and wanted to relay, as I imagine it's, it's something, it's certainly something that's been bothering our members and I expect it's been bothering yours too. Yeah. 
Okay, no, brilliant. Um, thank you. I can see it. So, yeah, there's going to be a lot of sort of FAQs coming out the back of this. Um, just a very final one, which I think is is not 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 very large, but could have a disproportionately large impact. Is the the website to find tenders um, is moving, isn't it? So we are no longer going to be on the OG website, um, and I think that one is a minor one. But I can imagine, Claire, that we may, you know, second of January get a whole load of. Um, before going to the uh, to the previous website so it was just that was one I just wanted to make sure that I flagged to the members and I think that's something that we're going to be putting up um, on our Brexit pages so just to be aware that yeah the tender finder um, or find a tender I think it's called at the moment is is shifting to a different website for UK based tenders going forward so just you don't be looking for them um, because you won't find them in the old place and you may wonder you know, come back in January, be enthusiastic about filling your order book and then find there is nothing UK based. So again, we will pop that one up on our website, but a minor one just to be aware of. OK, brilliant. Um, so that concludes us in terms of the questions, a really comprehensive session there. Lots and lots of technical detail. I can imagine that this is going to be a well watched back uh, webinar, shall we say, because we got through an awful lot of topics. And I think as people are going through and getting themselves ready, there's going to be quite a lot that we need to just check back in on. So thank you both very much for joining me. Um, as always, we have you know the, the link for this will be circulated afterwards, as well as the some of the links that we've cited around the guidance documents from the CEO. CLC and from the ACE. So we should have all of that in one place. Um, we've got a few more things happening um, this side of Christmas. So we've got some work that we're doing around net zero, looking at whether we're ready as a sector. Um, so that's quite interesting. It sort of brings home what we're expecting from the Committee on Climate Change later this week, but makes it a bit more real to us. So look out for that one um, tomorrow. And then on Friday, we've got Infrastructure Intelligence doing a sort of crystal ball gaze for 2021. So again, we'll be part of that. Um, so that's enough from us for today. Thank you again for joining us. Appreciate, you know, it's a hard, a hard topic to get your head around Brexit, particularly if you're an SME business. So just to remind you that, you know, we have got all the support on the website and Claire is there to do her best. Uh, pick up the red phone to James with any particular challenges, questions or clarifications that we that we might need and obviously we are you know working closely with James and the rest of the CRC in those conversations with government as and when we may or may not get a deal so watch this space thank you again both really appreciate you taking the time today and enjoy the rest of your day all take care bye thanks bye-bye thank you